Hello everybody, this is your TA Alyssa here and for Unit 4 we are going to talk all about demos and we are going to explore some of the Wolfram language and you know just kind of get a better understanding of some of the things that we've been talking about in lectures specifically things like cellular automata, networks, um, you know some of the measures we've been talking about and just sort of like get our hands on these kinds of things and actually like um, get familiar with them by practicing. Um, so for this demo specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, my favorite system ever, cellular automata. Um, basically, the idea of a cellular automata is that there are some cells. Uh, they can be squares, or they can be hexagons, or octagons. You know, just there's some sort of cell, and those cells are uh, have some sort of states, whether it's like a color or um, something like that, and those states change over time. Now, all the cells can change their colors at once, or some cells can change their colors at different rates than other cells. You know, the, basically the idea is that there are cells and they change over time. But for our particular purposes, we're just going to be looking at elementary cellular automata. And they're a really simple a simple example of what cellular automata do. Let's talk about rule 30 first um, of the elementary cellular automata. So here are some pro tips for using um, the Wolfram language real quick. So um, if, you, if you've never done coding before, I highly recommend using Mathematica as your first language. Um, I used it as my first language, and after that it was really easy to understand Python and really easy to understand C and all kinds of things like that. But what makes it so helpful is that you have all the documentation and everything that you need right in one package like this. For example, if I wanted to do something like cellular automata, you can just start typing uh, cellular automata and then all these things will pop up, right? So even if you don't know the exact function name, it's okay, you can just start typing and uh, some suggestions will pop up for you. You want to make a cellular automata, but you don't really know how to use it, that's fine. I mean, you can just hover over your function and get to the end of it. Sometimes you have to retype it. And this little I right here will take you straight to the documentation that is installed on your laptop, just like this. Perfect. So you can use it in the following ways. So um, you can give it a rule and an initial condition and a, a number of time steps. Or you can just give it a one time step. It does that automatically. You can do um, all sorts of things and then it even gives you some uh, examples and some possible issues, scope applications, you know, it just goes on and on. There's tons of things that you can look at in the documentation. It also says, see also, which I always find to be super useful when I'm just sort of playing around and wanting to do things, um, you know, just messing around, honestly, in general. It's really nice because you don't have to uh, sort through lines and lines in GitHub or go on Google and try to figure something out if you're working in Python, because it's all right here. Anyways, so for uh, cellular automata, we're going to be using a rule and an initial condition and some sort of time step, right? So um, to be boring, we're going to stick with rule 30. And let's um, do some simple initial condition of a white cell, a black cell, another white cell, and let's do it for five time steps. Now I'm going to um, type that out just like it had in the documentation, and I'm going to hit shift enter. And there we go. That's what it'll give us. So it's not really um, visually appealing because it's just a bunch of numbers, right? We want to see it like as we see it in textbooks and cool things like that. So I'm going to take this result. Usually you can like save this to a variable like, I don't know, output. And then you can put the output in something else. But, or you can just um, wrap it straight in like that. And I'm going to plot it on an array. So there's that following what a ray plot does, and then poof, there we go. And another way, a nice shorthand way to do that is instead of uh, wrapping it all like that, sometimes it's easier just to go straight from output and you do slash slash array plot, just like that. Nice shorthand way to do it, and there you go. That's your whole cellular automata in the Wolfram language, and uh, you can do all sorts of things. So if you just wanted a um, white cell, with a bunch, er, er, a black cell with a bunch of white cells, you can write your initial condition a slightly differently, as pointed out in the documentation, and you'll get something like that. And then, you know, 50 or 500, and it'll make as many zeros automatically as you need. 
So you've got like uh, black and white squares are really, really tiny right here. See, it's kind of hard to see. But you can see like they produce some sort of really cool pattern. Like, you know, the rule made this and how did the rule make that? Um, well, it's basically so for every every uh, row that you have. So like at this very, very top row, you have lots of white squares and one little you know, teeny black square and lots of white squares over here. And you want to say that for each cell that you have, whether it's black or white, what's it going to do next in the next time step? So that's basically the row underneath, super tiny. So for here, if you had a white square and your neighbors are also white, you would turn white. Or you'd stay white in the next time step. But if you're a white square and uh, this neighbor is black and this one's white, then you would turn into a black square, the next one. And, you know, so on and so on. And it basically gives a, uh, a, a result for every possible uh, configuration of your neighborhood, which is a neighborhood is yourself and uh, your neighbors as well. So um, because there are um, eight possible neighborhoods, there are eight possible outcomes for you as a cell. And uh, since there are two possible uh, outcomes, black or white, it's basically two to the eight. Um, and that gives you 256 rules to choose from. So because cellular automata are a sort of nice way of thinking about computation, we can ask all sorts of questions about computation, right? So this is kind of like a, a program, right? Um, you've got a, a set of rules. It's, it's almost like, you know, Newton's laws of gravity, right? Like if you have some sort of state of your system of the universe, what's it going to do at the next time step? Well, it depends on what the laws of physics are. So it's kind of the same way in terms of a basic computational universe. So if you have some sort of um, state of the universe, whether it's all white cells or all black cells or some sort of mix in between, what's it going to do at the next time step? So it's kind of fun to think about uh, like the universe in that way if, if you want to. So say we're looking at a, a rule table like this, right? Uh, and we want to know if it creates something interesting or not. You know, like I would say, well, this is pretty interesting. But it, it, for like a random rule, I mean, maybe I've never seen it before. Maybe 240. Is that going to do anything cool? I mean, I don't know, right? So it, is it possible to, to create some sort of um, program that will tell us if it's going to continue to make something really cool or if it's going to stop it reaches a final state right well you know that's actually just the same thing as uh, asking about the halting problem right and we know about the halting problem it's you know it's not possible to actually create some sort of program that if you feed it any uh, rule table will tell you if it's going to um, stop. It's going to reach all zeros or all ones or some sort of pattern and never create anything interesting after that. So it's not possible to do that, right? You actually have to run these CAs in order to see what they do. So for example, we had rule 240. Well, I don't know what it's going to do. We have to find out. Oh, okay. And, you know, we can change the initial condition here. So like, um, maybe I want a black square right there. Ah, okay. So maybe I want this here. Huh. You know, and then just by playing with the um, initial state, we can actually see that, well, it's basically a copyright program. So it just takes whatever it has from the previous state, and it just shifts it to the right by one cell. And remember that these boundaries um, are wraparound boundaries for elementary cellular automata. All right, but what about this rule table right here, right? So even though we're not able to actually say exactly what a cellular automata will do based on its rule pattern because we have to, if we have to run it, we can at least make some approximations, right? So for this one, no matter what state you're in and what state your neighbors are in, it's always going to become a zero, no matter what. So like, um, for example, like here's rule zero, and we give it some sort of initial condition, and we plot it out, it's always going to be zero. And that's true for absolutely any input we give it. It doesn't matter, even if we change the size. So if we wanted it to make it like really tiny, maybe like two cells big, it eh, doesn't matter. It doesn't care. But I think that's actually really interesting, right? Um, because in, when we look at data from the outside world, we're really interested in, okay, what rules created this data, right? I mean, you can imagine... Um, you know, scientists uh, way back hundreds of years ago looking at the stars and the planets wondering, like, you know, how can we understand 
what the stars and planets are going to do tomorrow um, based on what we see today. And in order to do that, they really have to understand um, the laws of gravity. They have to understand um, lots of laws of physics to do that. So we do the same thing with, like, you know, Twitter, right, and other complex systems. And we look at some all this crazy data that the world's throwing at us, and we have to wonder, you know, what kind of, what kind of rules are creating all of that, right? Um, and, you know, so that's a really difficult question to ask, but you know, we can come back to cellular automata and be like, okay, well, let's pretend the universe is nice and made of ones and zeros, and let's think about the, let's rethink about the problem. So here's some data that a cellular automata produced. It's an elementary cellular automata, but we don't know what rule produced it, right? So if we just looked at this, is there any way that we can infer what sort of rule made it? Well, yeah, we can, right? Because like a rule table looks like looks like this and basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to fill in these bottom squares like we don't know what these bottom squares are we know what these top squares are because you know those are just like for every scenario what's the outcome going to be but what we can do is we can say like well i mean parts of the rule table are actually instantiated in the data right so we can say that for um black white black it we get a white outcome Right, so we can fill in that part of the rule table. And then we can also say white, black, black will give us a black square, because remember these boundaries wrap around like that. So if we wanted to write all that down, we can see that from the first row to the second row, we see th this sort of um, rule table-ish sort of thing, from the second row to the third row, and, you know, and so on and so forth. So we're able to see... Um, are we able to see the entire rule table outcome, right? Because in order to know, like, for sure this is this rule, we have to see all possible outcomes for all possible neighborhoods. Or we have to see all the outcomes for all possible neighborhoods, right? So did we see all possible neighborhoods? Well, we saw six out of eight possible neighborhoods. So we can't say for certain what rule it is, but we can say that, well we have a good handful of rules that we're able to pick from. In fact, there's four rules that this could have been, right? Because we have um, only two neighborhoods that we didn't see. So this could be black, black, white, white, black, white, or white, black. So as you can imagine, um, the idea of causality is very strongly connected to this sort of idea of uh, computation because, you know, you want to know what sort of rule this data comes from. You might want to use that um, that rule to predict what state is going to happen in the future. So given, like, this initial state here, um, even though it was our initial condition, we could even ask what sort of states um, came before it that would actually give us this state. So we're asking about questions about causality. Um, but you remember that the halting problem is actually a fundamental limit on to what we are able to know about what programs are able to give us. So keep that keep that in mind. So that's pretty cool because um, if we just looked at a cellular automata universe, then we might be able to come up with some sort of experiment that, based on data what we see, we might be able to infer what sort of rule made it. And we can do some sort of large experiment where we come up with some sort of a generalized answer, at least in terms of um, the cellular automata world, and we can use those insights to sort of maybe understand how we can do this with the real world, like, I don't know, say something complicated like twi uh, tweets from Twitter, right? Um, so thinking of the things like that, um, another question that we might be interested in is, uh, at least in biology, is, you know, is it possible for biology to reach all possible configurations and, you know, meet those configurations over and over and over again, right? Because biology is really crazy and it's capable of doing tons and tons of things. And maybe we want to know that is biology able to give us um, you know, maybe in a million years, something that is like flying humans or something crazy. So we want to know if biology can give us any possible state, like, and can we reach any possible state of biology or biological evolution from where we're at right now? Well, how do we ask this question in terms of cellular automata? Well, we might want to say like, okay, we know that the world consists of black and white cells for this universe, and there's only a finite number of states that this thing can be in, right? So here's a, an example universe where the laws of physics 
are according are, are evolving according to rule 22 and there's only eight possible states that the universe can be in right so this can be uh, one state is all black cells one state is all white cells um, this is another state here and you can just enumerate it by two to the number of cells which is sometimes called the width so we have eight possible states right so reframing the question is kind of like asking is it possible to have a rule that will give you all the states forever and ever. So like it can even be in a loop, right? So if I'm in um, if I'm in this first state here and say I want to be able to get to black, black, white, will it give me that? So I'll give you a second to think about if a rule like that exists. Well, one thing you could do is you could actually just run all the rules. You say like, well, I don't know, but what I can do is I can test it, right? So you can loop over all possible cellular automata rules and all possible initial conditions, right? So let's go ahead and, um, just for the sake of, of a coding, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so a nice way to loop around things in um, the Wolfram language is by using table. There's lots of ways to do it, but I like to use table because it's fun. So you basically just put whatever thing you're trying to loop over, which is plotting a CA, and you put it in this table. And you say, um, format it like that, and your variable is going to be i, and we want to go from rule 0 to 255. Now I said there's 256 rules in the beginning, but we're counting 0 as the first rule, so we go all the way from 0 to 255, which is 256 rules. And then this is my rule, and I'm just going to change that to i. And we wait a second, and ta-da! This is all of our possible outputs. Um, this is all of our possible outputs for every possible rule with this initial condition. One thing that's also really important to note, if I want to see the cellular automata rule go through um, all the possible states at least once, well, I would have to make sure that there's at least eight time steps to do it. Because if I only do four time steps, well, I haven't observed the system long enough in order for it to for me to confidently say it's reached all the time steps. There's eight time steps, and I'm only seeing one, two, three, four, five states. So, you know, let's make this a little bit bigger. We call it 16. Now we can see a trajectory, which is a succession of all states. And we can see that, are we getting all possible eight states here? Da, 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 da. Eh, that one's pretty cool, but I don't, I don't see all possible eight states here. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. So, you know, it could be a problem with our initial conditions, um, or it could be something else. And actually, it is something else. So here's, here's the answer for you. It's actually not possible. Because <clears throat> think about the states of all ones and all zeros. If I wanted to say I wanted to visit all the possible states and have that in a loop, well, there's a problem. Because once I get to all the state, the state of all ones or all zeros, I can never leave. It's called an absorbing state because once you're stuck at all zeros or all ones, you can either switch between all zeros and all ones, which is like right over da, 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 here, or you get stuck in it forever. So you either get stripes or solids, and that is your universe forever. Well, okay, that's true in cellular automata land, but is this true in terms of biology? Are there absorbing states in the... Um, universe that we absor uh, observe in real life. Um, if we get stuck in those absorbing states, is there any way we can get out? Well, you know, that's kind of an answer philosoph for philosophy, right? Because there's, it's really difficult to enumerate all the possible states of the universe. It's actually impossible. But, you know, we can also think of things like the heat death of the universe, right? People like to, to talk about that in statistical physics and thermodynamics. Um, so, yeah, th people think that there are observing states, but also in terms of just biology alone, we're not sure. So all this has to do with dynamical systems, right? And that's going to be covered in the next section, where Narciss will talk about um, absorbing states and dynamical systems and how these things, how these things work together. So uh, I can do another demo after that. And, uh, you know, we can also talk about things like open-ended evolution that has a lot to do with dynamical systems and, you know, how can you... Um, create a system or 
how do systems, like ones that we see in real life, how are they able to constantly create patterns and states that are innovative and haven't never been seen before um, and continuously innovate and grow in complexity over time? But it's fun to think about um, the universe in terms of sim simple systems such as this one.